Okay, now that the panel is complete, um, I would like to welcome you to this afternoon's session on how to improve the access to finance for SMEs in the Western Balkans region. My name is Holger Münch. I'm at the EBRD, the regional director for the six non-EU countries of the Western Balkans. So it does not include uh, Croatia or Slovenia. But um, still, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, things that these countries have in common with the other countries of Southeast Europe. <clears throat> we heard today a lot about the opportunities that the uh, Belt and Road Initiative of the Chinese government, but also of other initiatives uh, by other players in the region, offer to the local economy and in particular local SMEs. To take full advantage of these opportunities, in many cases, companies would need to invest, though, to, to meet the standards and the requirements that... Yes? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Good. Thank you. So, in many cases, uh, companies will need to invest to, to up their game, to meet the standards and requirements of incoming investors, to play part in this uh, big game. And obviously investing means uh, the companies need access to finance. And uh, I think in this session, this afternoon, we would like to explore a little bit what opportunities are there, uh, what role do SMEs play in all this, and what kind of investments are needed and what kind of financing is needed to address these needs. And uh, uh, to this end, we have got this, uh, uh, assembled this distinguished panel here. There are a few seats in front here. If you'd like to sit in front. Sit, <coughs> you can pay the fee to Julio, no? But okay. Please, and instead of standing, why don't you sit in front here? So, <clears throat> as I said, uh, to, to explore these themes a little bit, we have assembled this, this panel here. Uh, we have got uh, Antonio Fanelli, who is a uh, senior advisor at the OECD. Um, <clears throat> we have Mr. Kira Dimanowski, Dimanowski uh, of the, member of the board of the Macedonian Railways. Uh, Mr. Ivan Franicevic, Franicevic? Yes. Franicevic. <laughs> of uh, Rasco, which is a uh, small and medium-sized company, medium-sized company, uh, active in the road maintenance sector. We have Mr. Ignacio Giacotto, who is the head of the international subsidiaries of uh, Intesa Sao Paulo. And then we have uh, uh, Tony Myron from the EBRD. Tony is uh, concerned with uh, providing uh, funds and uh, assistance to financial institutions in the region to online to small and medium-sized companies. But maybe let me start with um, uh, Antonio Fanelli. The OECD has uh, recently, last month, uh, updated an SME policy index. And um, Antonio, if you could maybe set the scene a little bit, uh, what's the situation, what's required to make companies more competitive and take advantage of the internationalization of, of the region? Thank you, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, as you mentioned, the OECD has uh, recently published a report that makes an assessment of the situation of the status of SME policy in the Western Balkans and Turkey. By Western Balkans, we uh, intend all the countries that are not already into the EU. So we cover Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, Montenegro, Kosovo, Macedonia, and uh, Turkey. Uh, this report is the fourth one that has been published. It's a regular uh, publication that we do every two, three years, and uh, is done in cooperation with other institutions, in particularly with the European Commission, uh, with the European Training Foundation, and uh, with the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. In fact, uh, the European Bank, uh, the BRD, is uh, covering one important dimension, the one that deals with access to finance, I will synthesize the results, but uh, probably the colleague of the BRD, if you are here, they could add also some other observation to my notes. Well, uh, we started to do this report in uh, 2007. As I say, we do it regularly. This is the fourth one. 
And uh, since 2007, we have seen uh, quite significant progress in uh, the uh, business environment for SMEs in the Western Balkan. In 2007, SMEs was a second class policy that all uh, the uh, accent and the priority was on privatization. But over the time, government has started to put notice on SMEs, has started to develop institutions on SMEs. Uh, now in all the country, there are SME development agencies uh, supporting uh, the sector. And uh, have started to invest some money, not much, into the area. And they've started to significantly and systematically improve uh, the business climate, particularly in reducing the administrative bar burden. So if we take a long uh, view, the situation uh, now is much better than that, uh, it was in uh, 2007. This uh, report uh, measure how much the policy in the West Western Balkan uh, approximate, get closer to the one on the European Union. In fact, we me measure how the Western Balkan countries are implementing the Small Business Act of the European Union. So we check if uh, these uh, policies in uh, the Western Balkan are based on the same sort of guidelines and uh, if uh, the practices are approaching do those of the European Union. And we've seen that there's been steady progress. We are still not there. We have a scale of one to five in terms of policies. Uh, five is the level when your policy is closer to the one of the European Union. And now the Western Balkans are around the level of three. So that's uh, still some way to go, but uh, in the right direction. But if we compare the result of the last report in 2016 with the one in uh, 2012, the last time they've done it, we have seen that the progress has been very marginal in some dimensions. One of these is access, access to finance. We have seen that for some countries we had even had a small regression. In fact, uh, these are the consequences of the global financial crisis that hit the region quite significantly. And then uh, the second crisis, the Eurozone crisis that came uh, later on in 2011, which also affected the region indirectly, but had uh, quite an, uh, an impact, particularly in countries like Serbia, for example, had uh, a second deep recession that only ended last year. So if we look at the dimension where the region is doing quite well, well, as I say, there's been progress on building up the institutions that uh, should implement the SME policy. Uh, all the countries now have an SME agency, have a clear mandate on uh, who is in charge of SME policy. They have adopted the definition of the European Union on, SME policy, on SMEs, and uh, also uh, they have uh, uh, develop SME strategies that help them in uh, organizing their intervention. What is missing uh, very much is the funding. In fact, uh, money spent on supporting the SME sector in the Western Balkan is far less than what is spent in a new member state. The main the reason is that uh, those sort of policy intervention are either funded through the budget of the government in the region, and uh, the budget have no much room for this type of intervention, and recently, in fact, there's been even a reduction of, of the funds available for SMEs and, uh, by, and uh, are supported by donor program, particularly those of the European <laughs> Union. In uh, the case of a new member state, most of the programs are supported by the structural funds, which are much bigger in terms of size and, uh, and uh, in terms of uh, uh, long-term intervention. So looking at uh, other regions, other dimensions where other regions have done quite well, well, we have seen that there's been a quite good progress in simplifying the regulatory environment, particularly company registration in most of the country became quite uh, simplified. Macedonia, for example, is uh, on uh, the top third uh, group in uh, the doing business, but all the other countries are falling up in uh, this area. Also, there's been an introduction of a number of, of uh, e-government uh, procedures that simplify the relation between the SMEs and uh, the government. Uh, if we compare, for example, the performance of the Western Balkan countries with Turkey in these areas, normally the Western Balkan countries are doing better than Turkey. Where they are not doing as well as Turkey is in the provision of services to SMEs. Uh, partly because the institutions are relatively new, so they are building up the capacity, and partly because of the lack of funding. So when we look at startup support, we see there are still the, the results are partly lacking, and uh, the instruments are very limited. 
uh, as well as when we look at the innovation, uh, the policy supporting innovative SMEs, also there we see that there are very few instruments and uh, this is an area that only recently has started to de be developed. Also on internationalization, the things are not going that well. Uh, there are trade promotional agencies in all the regions, but again, the lack of funding and uh, the lack of uh, an external network to supporting external enterprises is somehow penalizing the companies from the region. Uh, but there are good signs that the government are aware of this uh, type of problems and uh, they are working on it. So we expect that once uh, this budgetary problem will be solved, there will be an improvement in uh, the provision of services to SMEs. Now, if you look at access to finance in particular, we see that uh, the situation is uh, quite mixed. There's been improvement on the legal framework supporting uh, uh, particularly lending operation, uh, but there have been also other setbacks. And the amount of credit going to the private sector and particularly to SMEs in the region over the last few years is contracting instead of increasing. Uh, there's been a big uh, increase in the period before the crisis, and after the crisis we have seen that conditional lending condition to SMEs have been more restrictive. Demand from SMEs has also decreased, and uh, this condition has persisted for quite uh, a, a period of time. Therefore, uh, SMEs are facing uh, difficulties in, accept, in acceding financing, particularly bank uh, lending. There, are, there could be few things that uh, the country from the region could do in improving this situation. Uh, first, uh, they could uh, improve further the legal framework and uh, improving, uh, for example, information that uh, could be collected about the enterprise, the credit bureaus, they are covering only a limited number of, uh, a limited share of the population. They could uh, also improve uh, the access to the different register that are necessary in order to support uh, secure lending. Uh, for example, the cadaster that provide the information about the real estate uh, assets that can be provided as collateral to companies and setting up a register for movable assets. Another area where uh, the Western Balkan countries are relatively behind other regions and uh, for example, much behind Turkey is the area of the credit guarantee schemes. There are very few credit guarantee schemes operating in uh, the region and with very limited coverage. In Turkey, credit guarantee schemes are very much uh, uh, diffused and uh, access is uh, relatively easy. Bank financing provides most of the uh, external financing to companies, so it's very important to operate in uh, this area. The uh, banks operating in the Western Balkans are generally well capitalized. They are mostly foreign own, so they, have, uh, they are mostly subsidiaries of uh, large uh, European banks. They operate with high standard, but they are suffering from a legacy of non-performing loans that came from the financial crisis. The non-performing loans have started to decrease, but they are still remaining at a fairly high level in countries like uh, Serbia, Montenegro, and Albania, and it will take a bit of time before this will be absorbed. Uh, by the banks. Even if they are properly provisioned, the banks usually respond to a level of non-performing loan by introducing more stringent uh, credit requirement and credit condition to SMEs. So there is work that could be done uh, in uh, this area. Uh, and uh, the availability of credit is quite essential in order to support the recovery that is coming up, linking to the recovery that uh, is happening now, still weak, but happening in the Eurozone uh, market. The provision of other uh, financial instruments is still uh, relatively limited. There is a bit of leasing and a little bit of uh, factoring, but uh, still not very much uh, present if you compare with other countries, for example, the, those in Central Europe. And the provision of equity finance is limited, but the introduction of this new instrument, uh, the ADIF, the new fund that is being set up with the support of the European Commission and uh, with the intervention of the DBRD and the European Investment Bank should improve uh, the situation for what concerns equity financing. So that is a general overview of what is the situation in the Western Balkan. I hope it been, could be useful for the discussion afterwards. Antonio, thank you very much. Um, so there are some positive messages in terms of the overall improvement of the framework for SME development, but then clearly some 
challenges remain that uh, seem to be mainly related to the access to finance, which also, as you said, uh, hampers innovation and internationalization of uh, uh, local SMEs. So I think that, that is uh, an important message here maybe for, for the further discussion around this, this panel. But um, Mr. Dimanowski, if I could ask you, um, maybe just for, for background, the Macedonian railways um, are uh, purchasing from Chinese producers uh, trains that are actually financed by the EBRD. So there's a three-way link here. But I would also um, like to uh, ask Mr. Dimanowski to talk a little bit about the, if you like, the ecosystem that the Macedonian railways are operating within. So are there small and medium-sized companies that cooperate with you? So to see, is there a conduit of infrastructure investments to the SME sector? But uh, please, Mr. Dimanowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, it's a great honor to be here and to discuss in front of these important people in front of us. Yes, it's true, Macedonia Railway has recently bought six uh, multiple units from Chinese producer CRRC, which is now, after the fusing of two biggest companies in the world, CNR and CSR, uh, becomes the, the biggest producer in railway equipment and railway vehicles in the world. Uh, maybe few of the people in Europe knows that, but that's the truth. Bombardier, Siemens, and the biggest other producers are become, are late, like third place and after that. Uh, there is uh, also big skepticism around the world that Chinese uh, products maybe are not on the highest quality as they should be. But within this project uh, shows it wrong because it was a very competitive project on which uh, several European companies have uh, made the tenders and uh, uh, this Chinese company won on, on all levels, price and quality assured because the tender was uh, meant to be or it, it was uh, stated that uh, all the products which will be delivered to Macedonia to be according the latest TSIs which are technical standards for interoperability of European Union, which standards uh, more of, the, uh, more of the European producers are not fulfilling when they are creating the, their products, most of them. Uh, so these products are according that uh, TSIs and that creates the level of highest quality which can be achieved. Uh, the, the intention here today is to talk about the, the SMEs and the financing of the SMEs, which is the biggest issue they are facing with. Uh, according to my point of view, the cash flow or the financing of the SMEs creates the biggest problem and that problem is even bigger when a crisis is around because when the crisis is around, big companies, the, the states are preserving the money because there is no, uh, so the cash flow is on the lowest level and the, the biggest losers in this, in this case will be the, the SMEs because they don't have that cash flow to to sustain on the on the market, uh, also the lack of human of uh, developed and uh, high level human resources and uh, this uh, strategy for sustainable sustainable strategy. But also they have the advantages like flexibility, like uh, team spirit, customer satisfaction is higher on the on the level of SMEs than the biggest company because the biggest company are more bureaucratic, uh, lost in the procedures they have. And that's also a problem to the big company when the small, enter small and medium enterprise can came out. In, a, in our case, in Macedonian railways, I can say before one year or two, it was like 60% of the SMEs were participating on, on, the cost on the cost side of the company. So all the services and needs which railways need were like 60%, 60 which is quite the average around. But now, I think this percent is uh, even bigger. Uh, the, these companies are more competitive. Uh, they're trying to enter into not so much known railway business because all the, the parts, all, all the, the railway needs is very, very strict and uh, not so much known. And they are, they're, uh, they're 
chasing these opportunities, but still they're facing the problem because railways, as everywhere in the world, maybe they, they are big, but they are very bad pairs to the, to the sub sub -lars. <laughs> It's uh, common in the region, I believe it's common in Europe. And on, tho on those scale comes the uh, financing. The financing is the biggest issue, and that's why the banks are here to help them to improve their capabilities and uh, not just on the cash flow side, but also on the capabilities so in uh, soft measures like human resources. Uh, this project we are speaking about whole day, it's a great opportunity because now I'm passenger director, but before one year I was four years uh, director of sales of Macedonia Railways and this project, uh, not uh, one belt, or one road, sick road, but the Costco project for for Europe, uh, I was since the beginning of that project, and all the benefits, all uh, all competitiveness which can bring this project, I already told today during the discussion. And uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Tank already said uh, before, and I like that comment very much. Yes, the the, the future of the the business of the of the trading of Everything is in the e-trading, uh, e uh, but doesn't matter how you, which channel you will choose for sale. Uh, the biggest issue comes to the logistics and transport. Logistics and transport are more or less 30% of the price of the goods. Uh, if you improve, the, if you decrease the, the expenses in the logistics and transport, then you will have more competitive, uh, competitive goods on the market. Uh, this. What is China doing now? Maybe European Union should start it even earlier before. Because, uh, yes, it's 40 billion. Uh, uh, the, the Silk Road Foundation has 40 billion budget, but also there is an Asia Investment Bank, there is Exim Bank, which uh, creates $1 trillion budget for all the projects uh, on the belt from east to west. No, it's not China, it's India, it's, it's 4 billion people on the belt, so creates great opportunity because uh, all these countries are not on the highest level of the development of the countries of the economy, and they have a lot of potential to grow. That potential should be should be uh, exploited, and uh, we must be prepared, everyone to be prepared to, to, to participate on those markets. Also, China is an interesting market for, for European companies because uh, yes, the container from Shanghai or uh, Guangzhou to, to Piraeus is like uh, for, for to Thessaloniki is 400 euros, but vice versa is 200. It's uh, cheaper to go to from Thessaloniki to Shanghai than from Skopje to Thessaloniki, which is 20, 200 kilometers. So that is big potential to to be exported and uh, to to be faced with. Uh, enough <laughs> yeah no it's <clears throat> actually some some very interesting insights so it's basically two ways that I could see how you can uh, see this impacting on the SMEs the one thing is you said 60% of your services are actually sourced from SMEs again showing that um, <clears throat> the, the investment doesn't stop at the large infrastructure investment it trickles down into the economy and the small companies need to be equipped to respond to the opportunities, otherwise they are lost. And then obviously, very importantly, the improvement in logistics, which may open up markets, but again, to be able to compete in these markets, companies need to be competitive, need to invest, uh, beef up their, their human resources to, uh, to be able to respond. One more thing I would like to add. Uh, Macedonia is one of the first users of the Exim Bank credits, which Exim Bank gives to the Western Balkan community, and it was like 500 to 600 uh, million dollars for investment in infrastructure in the highways in Macedonia. Uh, the benefit of the SMEs the, is because it was 90% uh, of the employees in these uh, projects are from Macedonia. Macedonian companies are working, and Macedonian people are working, so they have. Mu uh, double benefit from this, uh, this investment. Yes, infrastructure comes 
it's uh, it is not uh, it is one of the biggest drivers of the economy because it includes a lot of sub suppliers during the construction works and that's why uh, improving the infrastructure brings at the first uh, involvement in the construction works and second after that better opportunity for their goods or for their services around the world thank you yeah, it's uh, again very interesting. I think that was pointed out by, excuse my Italian, by Mr. Uh, Ecker uh, this morning. E e Ecker? Uh, Ecker? Uh, Ecker? Ecker? <laughs> 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 no. <laughs> um, basically, that it is a bit of a myth that um, uh, Chinese investments are ring fence, that there is not a lot of trickle down into the local economy. I think these are some quite uh, uh, impressive statements uh, uh, that we have just heard here. But uh, maybe le let me lead on to Mr. Uh, Fonicevic, uh, whose company is actually engaged in the production of um, uh, transport maintenance equipment. So the, exactly, is, uh, who is uh, Mr. Fonicevic is much, much better placed to explain what it is than I am. I just want to point out that this is actually something that uh, is already relatively closely linked to what we are discussing here in terms of infrastructure investments. At the same time, it is a true local company and I think it's very important to hear firsthand what is uh, your business like, where do you see opportunities, but also uh, how do you uh, approach the financing and are there any challenges on the financing side? Uh, thank you, Holger, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here. I think the topics are uh, quite relevant, um, especially for us, because there were two words that are being mentioned today here quite a bit. One is infrastructure and the, one, the other one is SMEs. Since we are an SME, we are a company that manufactures road maintenance equipment, to put it broadly, but effectively we're a company that makes sure that when the winter comes and when the snow falls, the roads remain clear. So all that equipment that's cleaning out the snow during the winter, that's made by by us. Um, the second reason, so this is the part that's relevant in the infrastructure as, as well. Um, we are present mostly in Europe, um, but I'm also very proud to say that amongst 33 markets that we operate in, one of them is China. So we are one of the uh, rare creation companies for sure, uh, but also in our industry at least, uh, rare companies that has exports to China, and we're quite, quite proud of that. They're not big, but they are growing, which uh, gives, me, gives me quite a bit of hope that one of the opportunities, as you mentioned, that I see is that, of course, the Belt and Road Initiative and that the road works and goes, obviously, both, both ways. Um, we are at the border of becoming a large company. Actually, we have almost 250 employees, which would put us in, a, in the larger, larger company sector, which actually wouldn't be true since we only have about 17 million euros in, in revenue, so there are some issues with the definitions there, I would say, uh, which would effectively also reduce our access to finance. That's the interesting part. I'm not sure if you could call a company with 17 million euros in revenue a large large company. I would say probably not, but because of the definition of the number of employees, we are now close to becoming a, a large company. And this is actually one of, the, one of the problems that we're facing. Other than that, we have uh, financing needs on a, on a regular basis where we finance a lot of working capital. We're a very seasonal business. So uh, every six, six months or so, we lever up and we delever. So we have to get working capital to sustain us through the off season get money or cash to sustain us through the off season then we we pay this cash back after we've made our deliveries usually towards the end of end of the year this is one type of financing the other type of financing is long-term financing that we use for investments into usually building up more manufacturing capacity and these two types of uh, uh, finance it so far we have done mostly through bank debt and uh, all of this was financed by by Croatian banks the long-term part was financed by the Croatian bank, well, Croatian version of EBRD, I would say. Um, and the short term, which is uh, the debt we use for working capital, was actually financed by our commercial banks in Croatia with good rates and six to 12 months, months of financing. We, from 2008 to 2016, have grown quite a bit. We've actually grown almost three times in revenues, three times in the number of employees. and. Um, we did not experience um, 
even through the crisis, but since 2010 to 2015, we actually did not experience any issues with bank financing. But the only reason why we didn't experience any issues is because we have a lot of assets. We're a manufacturing company. We have a lot of buildings. Banks like buildings as collateral, and uh, we didn't have any problems accessing finance. However, um, for a lot of small and medium businesses that do not have a lot of assets that they can use as, as collateral, uh, this is actually a very, very, very large obstacle. Um, and without these assets, it's actually very difficult to get for a small and medium business, it's very difficult to get a, a, a loan in Croatia, at least. But I will also say this applies to the entire entire West Balkans region. So this is actually one of the one of the problems that we're facing is that if we want to continue growing, we actually and if we want to continue financing our growth through debt, we effectively have to continue building buildings, which is interesting. <laughs> it's true, unfortunately, when you think about it, we have to build a new building to get to get a loan to. To, uh, to continue growing. This puts us in a position where we're sort of have the only option of, of using organic growth if we want to finance it through bank debt, or um, on the other side of the extreme, and this is actually goes to the core of the SME financing problem, um, on the other side of this extreme you have private equity funds. And this is the, the obstacle to financing is actually of course, as it usually is, is who's gonna take on the risk. Commercial banks are not here uh, to take on risks of small and medium businesses of their day-to-day -day business. Yes, in so much that the regulation allows them to do so, but I would never expect a commercial bank to be reckless, especially because part of the money is actually coming from me and from, from you. Um, but we, other than the banks, we actually don't have a lot of choices. There are niche financing options, like for example, EBRD in Croatia, but those are reserved for a relatively small fraction of, of, of companies. Um, and, and there are options, private equity is fairly undeveloped. On the startup side, on the small, small uh, businesses, you have Venture Capital Fund, which has now been started in Croatia for the first time since 10 years. Uh, I've just learned about that yesterday. That's a great thing. But uh, other than that, you basically have banks and you have, you have private equity money. Private equity for majority of small and medium businesses is actually not interesting. It's simply too expensive. And also, the growth that's required by that type of financing is enormous. And most of the proprietors of small and, uh, small and medium businesses, at least in Croatia, but I would again expand this to the region easily, are effectively not interested in trying to sustain a 30% growth rate in order to exit in, in five years. So when you think about it, the only option you have for financing is bank debt. And if you don't have assets, you most, in most of the cases, cannot really get any substantial amounts of, of bank debt. On the other hand, and let me, let me finish with this, one of the great opportunities for the financial institutions um, in the region, I would say, in the entire region, and especially in Slovenia and Croatia, is the fact that after the, let's call it the fall of communism, after the end of communism, if you want to put it that way, uh, in, uh, or after the end of Yugoslavia, in, in our case, which is in 1990, 1991, there was a lot of companies that were formed. These companies were formed by people who were at the time 35, 40, 45 years old. 25 years later, majority actually of these people have no, there is no succession to these businesses. So there is a, there is a very large potential in already now and probably in the next five to, five to 10 years for private equity, but not the private equity that we are familiar with right now, which is requesting exit multiples which are beyond what majority of the businesses can even accomplish, let alone be interested in, in, in trying to entertain. So that's just okay. from our side. No, very interesting. And uh, I think uh, all three speakers uh, pose a few challenges to the financing side of, um, of, of the panel here in terms of the availability of finance, uh, the, the need for substantial collateral I suspect equity financing is not so much on uh, in uh, your area, but um, uh, yes, I would like you, Mr. Uh, Giacotto, to maybe respond to some of that, but also just tell us how do you approach SME financing in the region? I have to say that Intesa is a very important partner for EBRD, especially in the Western Balkans uh, region. So uh, one of the partners that allows us to, to reach out to SMEs that we can't finance directly. Uh, please, Mr. Giacotto. 
Okay, thank you. It's, uh, it's for me also very interesting to listen to you and to listen obviously the other the other part of other version on, on how things are uh, happening. I think let's starting with why we are here and what we are talking on SMEs. SMEs are really backbone of any economy. This is a slogan that we hear and, and we repeat. And this is very true in, in certain countries like Italy where really SME is this, but this maybe it's not that true in, in the region that we are talking in, in the Western Balkans. In, if, if in Europe the, the percentage of participation of SME and GDP is uh, it's, um, estimated around 55, 60% on the GDP in, in our region, it's uh, much uh, lower. I remember the, the, the number in Serbia is, is roughly 30, 34% of uh, total, so of the contribution of GDP. So it's clear that, this, that there is, is not a good information for the country and not for us because we as a bank, we are, we as a bank, we are just a company who are providing financial services. So we are more than happy to, ser to serve more customers because it's basically our scope. So we, we will be uh, very happy and very satisfied and, and we will be doing our business anytime when we are expanding our business to any, any segment. It's true that when we are doing business, we have always to take in mind what you were just saying that the money that we are lending to a company is your money. So it's not the man shareholders' money or, or government money or something like this. It's depositors' money. So and this is why when we uh, analyze a transaction and we decide to lend money to somebody, we have to take it, uh, do it seriously in a responsible manner, also with all the respects for the borrower because we cannot lend more money that, they, that he will be able to, to re to repay and so on. So this is when uh, sometimes everything comes to the bank and saying the, blaming the banks for lacking of uh, growth. They say, okay, we have our part of, of responsibility, but we, we have to act exactly with responsibility with the society. But if I, if I say, let's say, uh, World Bank is doing an... Uh, an um, an uh, exercise that is very, very known on this do, doing business. Probably you, many of you know that they produce every every year, and they rank what is the how easy is to is to make business in every country in the world, and and then you can compare in different areas. Uh, there are, if I I I was analyzing also how in the last report in the in the in the doing business 2016 how the, the region and the Western Balkans uh, are, are ranked uh, among other countries in Europe and so on. And they are, they are doing, in terms of uh, uh, easiness to do a bus uh, business, they are relatively okay. So it's not, it's not a problem. There are some countries where we have uh, some, uh, at least according to this survey, there are issues with the enforceability of the contract, that this is obviously something that for <laughs> banks is something important. The issues with the, the um, registration of land and with the registration of property, that also in terms of collateral is also important. But one of the most important issues that is also evaluated is the access to credit. There is a specific chapter on, on this, this is it. how easy is, is, is to get credit in, in that given country. And uh, if you go to that, you will see that it's, um, it's, it's uh, except Slovenia that is ranking strange, strangely, relatively uh, badly, let's say on the, on the second half of the, of the rank. All the other countries in the Western Balkans rank in relatively good terms, ranking around 30, 40 percent. Uh, it means 30, 40 ranked is a, is a for example, much better than Italy itself. So I think that at least this is what the companies are saying, how difficult it is for them to get access to credit. And if there is another element that we can, that we can choose, the saying that what is the, I think from the point of view, as uh, has been said before, majority of the banks operating in the area are part of the international groups based in uh, Europe, um, Italians groups, uh, Austrians, and so on. And, and they are basically strong banks with, a, uh, let's say, big, sh 
shoulders and capacity of, of, uh, of lending with a, with a certain level. If we see in Europe, there is one indicator, very, very, very simple, that is the, what is the uh, total banking assets uh, in relation to the uh, GDP of the country. This is an indicator of how the financial system is uh, developed and if it is uh, ultra developed or underdeveloped or something like this. In the European Union or in the countries of uh, Western, um, Western part of uh, Europe, the, this indicator could go from 150% to 100. It means that total assets of the bank are twice or two times the, to the, the, the GDP of the, of the country. How this compare with the with the uh, the countries and the region that we are talking? It's very very low. So it means it may be very low. I mean that they are, all the countries are moving between 30 and 40 percent of the GDP of the country. It means that it's it's clear that there is a, a big room for a grow uh, growth in terms of banks. I think banks are they have. Uh, there is a, a strong, solid uh, bank system that went very well through the crisis. There were no public intervention, no, uh, no taxpayer in, in, in the region was uh, paying anything to rescue banks and so on. So the banks are in, in good shape. In good shape, the issue of uh, MPLs, is, that was mentioned before, I think is, is very acceptable and, is, and the banks are moving and when we see that the the, the numbers are, are improving. So what I see that are all the preconditions are there for, for, the, for the banks to grow. And as I was saying before in this morning, I said that uh, we need always two, part, two, two parties to, to, to borrow money. So the bank is, uh, will be ready to, to lend money because as I said before, this is our this is part of our business, so it will be silly from our side if we will not be doing our business. So, but when we talk on the on the on the part, there is a need from the from the counterpart. So, there is uh, some uh, some things that uh, can be improved. Was mentioned the credit bureau. I think this is I, I fully agree. Is is one of the one of the uh, crucial elements and we see what, what could be the strong correlation of, uh, of better performance because this is something that is helping the banks to identify the good borrowers. And, uh, and, and this is something that is helping at the end everybody because then will help the bank also to, to price uh, properly the, the loans depending on the, on the quality and, and the track record and performance and so on. So, I think there are uh, some elements that can be done, but I'm sure that from the, from the part of banks, uh, we are more than happy. As I, as I announced this morning, we, we have, uh, in the region, we have 500 branches in uh, Sintesa San Paolo, and these branches are ready to, to serve also, uh, also SME customers, for sure, and, and uh, we are dedicating uh, one billion of uh, loans to SME, tenors after up to up to 15 years and we are uh, and we will be more than happy to to fulfill that target and to be able to to provide and to support uh, and the, the growth and the success of the countries because as I repeat many times we are part of every country in which we operate and when the the success of a country is our own success and, and this is something that is helping also uh, so we are ready to to uh, cooperate Thank you very much. So um, the good news is the banks are willing to lend. There is clearly still a, a large gap that, uh, of catching up to do if we hear 30 to 40 percent uh, of uh, banking assets to uh, GDP, 100, 150 percent is what we see in, in uh, the EU. So a lot of potential is there. You pointed out some of the, the challenges that have to do with the framework, but also with institutions like credit bureaus. What can we do to, to bridge this gap quickly, I think, because we can't wait until all the uh, regulatory, the policy framework is in place. And that's why I turn to Tony Maron from the EBRD, who I hope has got the answer for that. 
Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try and not um, duplicate what some of the other uh, speakers have said. But I think one thing coming out of this conference, um, uh, particularly this morning, was the huge opportunity that the Belt and Road Initiative represents for the, the Central Asia and Southeastern Europe region. And I think it's particularly interesting that the, um, the European Investment Plan, the so-called Junker Plan, and the uh, Belt and Road Initiative will be working together. So this will stimulate a huge amount of spending and investment all across this region. And this is really a game changer, I think, as one of our colleagues said uh, early on, I think the Italian finance, finance minister. Um, the challenge for um, institutions like EBRD is to try and bridge this gap that's been identified. Um, as Ivan said, uh, good borrowers, good companies have no problem getting funding. In all the markets, they can borrow at the finest rates, uh, particularly if they have security. But there are issues with the capital markets and the capital structures in the, uh, in the countries we deal with. Um, EBRD, and Claudio mentioned this, our MD for Small Business Initiatives uh, this morning, EBRD is trying to in some way create a bridge uh, between the banks, who are the best sources of finance in the market, and the borrowers who cannot be served or who feel they're not being served. And over the years, we've, um, uh, the last three or four years, we've introduced a number of schemes uh, based on inclusion or incentives or deploying uh, grants or aid from donors, particularly the EU. And I just did a little exercise before this session just to see uh, what we had done. So we have these various schemes uh, called Women in Business, where we try and uh, introduce uh, women who are, um, and I see Antessa is one of our major partners in, in the region and particularly in Serbia. Um, women in Business is designed to bring women who, who have no track record, no financial record, uh, but who have a business sense where the bank can be helped, reduce the risk and get a loan from the bank. And this is a key platform for the bank. It's under our inclusion um, umbrella, so we're talking about bringing in people who normally can't access finance. We also have our competitive support facilities, again, heavily supported by uh, technical assistance, where we try and help companies uh, upgrade their procedures, processes, production, and general standards to EU standards. And this is particularly applicable for the, um, uh, the pre-accession countries, which is a lot of the, uh, the Balkans. Uh, we have other mechanisms, our private sector support facility, again, where we try and use grants to in some way alleviate or mitigate the risk so that it presents uh, an attractive uh, lending proposition for the banks. And we have our energy efficiency facilities also trying to incentivize not only investors in energy efficiency measures or renewable energy investors, but also the suppliers to these, um, uh, these sectors. So these mechanisms, and I, I reckon we've, we've invested about nearly half a billion, 450 um, uh, million over the last four or five years, uh, with 38 participating banks across the region. Uh, over 4,000 um, 4, loans have been financed. So these, our view would be that these would have been the clients who would have been responding that they have difficulty in accessing finance in the various, uh, in the various surveys. Um, what, what EBRD wants to do, and I think other players as well, like KFW and EIB, is to try and focus on these areas where there is demand, but the demand is not being met. Uh, we know that the banking sector in every one of our countries is very strong. It's uh, the leading sector in many of our countries. The regulator in many of the countries operates to a very high standard. So these are centers of excellence in all of our countries. The banks are highly liquid. The financial system in every country is highly liquid. They're stable. They've survived the crisis. And the challenge for the international financial institutions like EBRD, KFW, EIB, is to try and help the banks lend responsibly, responsibly but re lend into these higher risk areas uh, that will help growth. The, um, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, is going to create a lot, lot of opportunities and I think there's a huge responsibility on both the multilaterals and IFIs and the banking sector to try and ensure that SMEs contribute to, uh, to growth. Um, some of the areas where we can, um, uh, uh, the EU and IFIs can help uh, is trying to uh, help the banks stretch their tenors. Um, uh, there's a lot of availability of short-term finan financing on the market and uh, commercial banks feel particularly comfortable with short-term financing, but some investment requires longer-term financing, 10 or 15 years. 
it's good to hear that Intesa has uh, decided you know, to set aside a fund for long-term financing, and we'd be happy to work with any commercial banks that want to provide uh, longer-term financing. Uh, a key aspect of um, our uh, intervention in the SME sector and support for the SME sector is training and standards and education. And again, through deploying technical assistance, uh, EBRD tries to help not only the um, uh, clients of the banks, but their staff and even the bank staff, uh, maybe to train in terms of ener energy efficiency analysis or agricultural lending or the particular features of uh, different sectors. Um, we're, we're also looking at trying to um, deploy our balance sheet to help um, the commercial banks reduce the risk in, um, in certain types of financing. So we've been involved, and Holger is intimately familiar with this, with a, a, a support facility for agriculture in Albania, uh, where again we're dealing with the, the leading banks, including Intesa, and our aim there is to, uh, to give the banks uh, support in terms of risk sharing on a portfolio, but also first loss on certain, uh, uh, certain elements and certain activities. And the idea is that uh, the commercial banks, our partner and EBRD can um, responsibly and prudently address um, the needs of borrowers that are pretty hard to finance but from a normal commercial uh, risk perspective. I think the, the type of opportunities, though, that the, um, uh, the uh, one, sorry, the belt, the correct term is belt and road initiative offers are uh, uh, quite amazing. I think Dr. Wang Wei mentioned this morning the difference in transport times uh, from Chinese cities to European cities compared to by rail compared to um, shipping, uh, reductions from 45 days to 18 days. These are really significant savings in time for, particularly for fast moving goods industries, for fashion industries, for all sorts of industries where clients want to uh, access goods uh, fairly quickly. And again, one of the speakers this morning emphasized uh, e-commerce, and I think this is a critical area. And I know EBRD has a program supporting innovation, and we're keen to see, to work with uh, e-commerce and uh, innovation clusters. Um, some, of the, some of the issues that um, our, uh, my colleagues uh, mentioned here, and I just wanted to, uh, to touch on. Um, it's interesting that today uh, in Beijing, there's a bilateral between the um, EU and, um, and the Chinese government on this very issue. So the, the Belt and Road Initiative is, is very topical, and the, the Beijing bilateral apparently is focusing on infrastructure investment, innovation, and economic development in rural areas. And rural development in many of our countries is fairly important. A sizable proportion of the population still lives in rural areas, is still engaged in um, small-scale agriculture. And again, the type of initiative that we have, um, are trying to develop and hopefully will develop this year in Albania should have a substantial impact on agricultural employment, agricultural production, and added value and export values for the, uh, for the economy. Um, the, the, um, uh, Marco's uh, 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 discussion on the impact of these infrastructural investments and, and the supply chain linkages are critical. And the more port developments and rail developments and road developments we have, there would be greater opportunities for uh, maintenance uh, operations, uh, logistics operations, uh, labor supply companies, food supply companies, catering companies. All of these uh, endeavors open up many, many opportunities uh, for, uh, for SMEs. And of course, uh, startup businesses don't have a track record, they don't have a property, they don't have security for the banks. And again, this is where our new focus, which hopefully will continue to develop on risk sharing, first loss cover, and so on. These instruments will help the, um, the smaller SMEs and the micro SMEs. Um, the, um, uh, the comparison with, um, we, we've been quite active in Turkey in, uh, in recent years. And many of the, particularly in the eastern part of Turkey, many of the challenges that we're looking at in the, uh, the Balkans and uh, southeastern Europe are, are the same. Um, the uh, 
Turkish, um, Turkish banking system, like the banking system in the Balkans, is highly developed. Uh, but when EBRD first entered the market, one of the comments that we got from businessmen was that, it, from smaller businesses, that access to finance was a, a challenge. And we've tried to work on that, and I think we've successfully worked on it, pushing our programs into Eastern Anatolia, into sectors like uh, women and business and energy efficiency. So I think I'll, I'll wrap up on that, but uh, I think the, 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 the combination of the um, uh, One Belt, um, uh, One Road initiative, or the, the one, what is it, the Road and, um, uh, Ro Belt and Road initiative, um, together with SME financing, is a, is a very, very um, topical and very appropriate uh, subject. And I think um, certainly the international, uh, international financial institutions, together with the banks, can address these challenges and can successfully help the um, uh, development, investment in the SME sector and development of the SME sector. So thank you. Thank you, Tony. So I think uh, so, uh, this is a lot about uh, broadening the product range, uh, uh, increasing the, 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 the universe of eligible uh, clients for commercial banks. <coughs> One <coughs> issue that uh, came to my mind when I was listening to the right-hand side of the panel here was there was a lot about receivables financing, uh, franchise, um, uh, factoring. Um, uh, it seems that the, uh, the railway, uh, uh, the SMEs that work with railways across the region could benefit from some sort of factoring where they could monetize their uh, receivables to help with the cash flow. I think Antonio pointed that out as one of the weaknesses in, in the region. So if I may turn to the left, uh, to, to Mr. Jacoto, what are your thoughts on these uh, not very grand kind of new product initiatives, but actually pretty down-to-earth uh, 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 products that could really help SMEs? Sure. Let's say in a, basically what the bank, what the bank loves more than buildings, as was said before, what we love are cash flows. So mm -hmm. if, if when the company sh is showing us that they, they have cash flows, we are extremely happy because basically what we will do is what we intervene in the cash flows and we will help the, how, to, how to move their, their, their equity, whatever. The uh, buildings and this type of things, okay, is this, is, this is a very, um, it's a traditional way of doing things. Okay, I'm getting some, I'm getting some collateral, but this is is not our aim, and we have also <coughs> a, a bad experience on uh, on collecting our our, our debts through selling uh, real estate assets because it's not, uh, believe me, it's not a business for the bank. So we 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 are losing money when we are doing so. So while if we are able to find a way through factoring, through um, discount of uh, receivables or some other uh, simple uh, formulas, we are extremely ready to, to do it because it's basically something that will help the, the, the company to anticipate certain cash flows and we, are, and we are, let's say, balancing the risk maybe from, uh, from uh, the borrower, our direct borrower is, could be relatively weak, but then we, we rely on the on the soundness of the payer of, of the of the supplier of the of the customer of, the, of our customer. So is there anything missing in the regulatory framework, or are you ready to roll out uh, factoring across the region? No, we we in, in, s in several countries we are already doing. It's uh, they are true. There are uh, some um, in some cases elements of uh, of. Uh, Getting uh, certainty, and uh, as, as, that's, uh, as was uh, said before, but it's, um, it's, it's again an issue that has to be uh, discussed uh, basically country by country. But it's, uh, it's, it will be uh, basically we, we do all this, uh, with uh, in a customer by customer, we, we do uh, solutions uh, tailor made for, for that, but basically under this basis of. Uh, of, um, let's say, playing with the cash flows and anticipating. Yeah. Thank you very much. Allow me one more question, and then I'll open it up to the, uh, to the audience. But it's something that struck me when you were talking about the, 
the need for equity financing and uh, combined with the question of succession planning. Uh, many of the first generation entrepreneurs are reaching an age where they may want to cash out and enjoy uh, their retirement and the, the fruits of their, their work and want to pass it on to somebody else. I, I seem to remember from Germany that uh, actually there were Chinese companies that looked for what we call in Germany the hidden champions, sort of SMEs that are leaders in their field. So there was a way for Chinese companies to access maybe innovation or just a very sound market position in the European market. Would that be something that um, where you could see some potential that actually Chinese companies are coming into the region looking for these hidden champions where the owner is ready to, to sell out? Um, I believe so, actually. That was uh, the thing that I wanted to say. Uh, there is a huge opportunity for this, um, be it for, for, for Chinese or for other investors. But I also believe that um, given that the uh, trade deficit is definitely on the European side, I think that for Chinese investors, it's not only a pure financial play, this can be a very strategic thing for them. So I actually strongly believe that they would have the most, uh, the most benefits. And you're right, there are examples, um, quite, quite a few now, of uh, larger companies, but still relatively small, being taken over by, uh, by uh, Chinese counterparts, I would say, or Chinese competitors, and that are now working together on R&D and are bringing technology from Europe to China and vice, and vice versa. So I think there is a lot of, a lot of opportunity there and um, I think a, a well-capitalized fund would actually oh. work quite well, oh. quite well on equity investments and uh, in Germany it's actually one of the, one of the places as well for this. Uh, that's, that's actually quite interesting as well. Okay, so that's another interesting uh, dimension of how an increased uh, Chinese-European cooperation could bring finance to, to SMEs. But now let me let me open it to the audience. We've got a question here in the first row. If you could just state your name and uh, the organization you represent. Uh, sono um, Gustavo Gagliardi, già ho parlato questa mattina e sono presidente di questo centro studi sulla connessione, l'interconnessione tra la proposta di interconnessione tra il Mediterraneo e, e One Belt, One Road. Perché parlo anche questa volta? Sono professore all'Università di Tor Delgata, mi occupo di, di cluster, di infrastrutture e di corridoi infrastrutturali. Eh, in effetti, brevemente, questa è la proposta che sarà portata dall'Italia al G20, praticamente l'interconnessione tra l'anello del Mediterraneo e il grande anello della nuova via della seta, One Belt, One Road. Almeno così è stato eh, detto che sarà portata nella documentazione italiana. Però parlo delle PMI, parlo delle PMI perché, e faccio l'esempio, stiamo studiando il corridoio Napoli-Bari, delle ferrovie dello Stato. Delle ferrovie dello Stato, il corridoio Napoli-Bari, guarda caso, è una parte del diciamo un'infrastruttura fondamentale per la crescita del mezzogiorno d'Italia corridoio adriatico tirreno e nello stesso tempo è anche un corridoio dei TNT è lo Scandinavian TNT che scende dal, dai paesi scandinavi fino alla valletta stupidamente si ferma alla valletta non va anche in Africa e quindi eh, perché il corridoio nord-sud potrebbe anche investire l'Africa ma nello stesso tempo un po', non tanto per questa proposta, ma perché i cinesi così vogliono, fa parte anche della nuova via della seta. Fa parte della nuova via della seta perché praticamente a parte i porti, ma ci sta anche tutto il discorso che la via della seta, la via marittima, risale dallo stretto di Suez. Risale dallo stretto di Suez, sbarca, non è che sbarca in modo colonialista, ma sbarca per tutta questa grande massa di popolazione mondiale per la crescita e lo sviluppo di questa massa, 60% per cento dell'umanità. Bene, interessa anche noi. Perché parlo di piccole imprese e piccole e medie imprese? Innanzitutto vorrei domandare se i vantaggi sono minori degli svantaggi o gli svantaggi sono minori dei vantaggi. Secondo me 
i vantaggi sono maggiori degli svantaggi. Da un punto di vista del rischio, ritengo che in effetti c'è un vantaggio che la piccola e media impresa non ha bisogno di grandi investimenti e soprattutto investimenti di long term investment. Ha bisogno di investimento per start up, per partire in certi settori le energie rinnovabili, in certi settori come la l'efficienza energetica e così via beh, in questi settori io credo che qual è il vantaggio maggiore? si partecipa in questo modo a quel che è l'obiettivo principale lo sviluppo economico, lo sviluppo economico la crescita enorme ma soprattutto lo sviluppo sostenibile lo sviluppo sostenibile è il maggiore vantaggio chiamiamolo indiretto del discorso delle PMI dell'intervento del PMI e allora a questo punto eh, chiaramente da un punto di vista della realizzazione qual è il ritorno della Napoli Bari ma io penso che sia tutto lo sviluppo delle, dei, dei distretti industriali delle PMI nel mezzogiorno d'Italia ed è quella la prima, il primo vantaggio quindi noi eh, quando proponiamo da Napoli Bari pensiamo che lo stesso operatore ferroviario sia un soggetto attuatore soggetto attuatore di cosa? dello sviluppo Territoriale. Quindi non soltanto fare rasso ferroviario, ma dare luogo a quel sviluppo territoriale, economico e industriale per cui praticamente si, si opera in questa, in questa luce qui. Io credo che questo debba essere tenuto conto soprattutto dalle, dalle banche, dagli istituti di credito, stamattina parlavo anche delle banche nazionali di sviluppo, cassa depositi e prestiti quanto riguarda l'Italia, ma in effetti anche facilitare l'accesso al credito per esempio attraverso i, i mini bond o i, i bond alle, alle reti di PMI, alle reti di PMI, è un discorso che va portato avanti in maniera seria e convinta dei risultati che possa dare. Secondo me il discorso delle reti di impresa, si, piccole e medie imprese, si, si collega anche a quello discorso che fa, fa, fa la Cina, in grande modo, della complementarità della catena di produzione e della cattura di valore tra diciamo, reti di imprese lunghe transnazionali, transcontinentali che praticamente possono vedere impegnati contemporaneamente sia imprese italiane sia imprese cinesi. Grazie. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I think what you said um, um, for, for those who haven't had uh, trans translation uh, in the room, the gentleman, uh, sorry, the, the gentleman uh, pointed out the importance of uh, transport corridor going through Italy uh, to, to Bari and on to to Malta, which is uh, the other leg of the, the Silk Route. Um, I think that the question I take from, uh, uh, from your intervention is, uh, are there new instruments like mini bonds or bonds to groups of SMEs? In my view, that is for the Western Balkans, uh, probably premature, but I don't know whether Mr. Giacotto wants to comment on something like that. Maybe there's in Italy something that as a model that... Probably I will not be <coughs> the, the most uh, adequate person to talk on in Italy. I think what I can say in, in, the, in, the, in our region, the capital market is still underdeveloped, but I don't think that it will be, uh, let's say, this uh, even... The, the issue in bonds is, a, is, is not a problem, but the problem is who then will invest on, on that and so on. So that. That's uh, definitely the case in the Western Balkans with very nascent uh, capital markets where you start with, a, if at all, with a, a high-grade uh, uh, issuers before you can then move down to, to SME. So we are many years away from, from that at this point. But are there any uh, other questions, Giulio? office of EBRD Montenegro, but uh, because I'd done something terrible in my previous life, I was in Albania, Kosovo, Bosnia, etc. Um, no, I want to take this opportunity to uh, really to say a few words about, about the, what could be the partnership with a Chinese company in the region, because I think this is, a, we are a little bit losing the, uh, the focus on, 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 on this conference, because uh, The fact that Ch uh, China became a member of EBRD is something extremely important because it means to apply all the rules, uh, all the practice, all the procurement rules, etc., that are typical of uh, EBRD, but basically typical of the European Union and uh, all this region. It means that uh, we, uh, a small and medium enterprise, and the example 
in Macedonia is a, is a clear example of, of, of partnership, could be uh, <clears throat> extended to the other country of the region. Uh, I have a memory of the first project that I financed uh, in, um, in Albania back in 2003 with, uh, for a uh, revamping of a cement factory in which was chosen a, a Chinese company. At that time, the Chinese company brought 700 people from China and uh, the real impact for uh, the local population for Albania etc., was negligible. This is something that really needs to be completely changed and I think the, uh, the Chinese company are completely aware of that. We are looking right now, for example, in Montenegro, the construction of 42 kilometers of this highway that will link Montenegro with, uh, with Serbia. And Chinese company uh, will uh, that finance the project and will uh, implement the project, but there will be a role of a, at least up to 30% of local companies. This is really is something that we have to take cons completely in consideration because uh, Chinese company need to be more and more open with uh, um, the region. Uh, it's clear that this region is uh, for them extremely important because of the connection that uh, Adriatic will represent to the rest of Europe. But it will be also important to have a completely different approach to support small and medium enterprise in, in, um, in the region. And this is, could be a fantastic catalyzer for, for development. Um, Another small consideration related to what uh, Tony in particular said related to the instruments. Well, for SMEs, there is not lack of credit in the region because uh, uh, more or less in all the country there is uh, an excess of liquidity. All the country, uh, commercial banks are ready to finance. The problem is a lack of innovation, a lack of serious project, a lack of uh, serious SMEs. This is a big problem. And to, fa to, to respond to that, EBRD started with some innovative product like uh, equity investment for um, small and medium enterprise. But we have probably to be, and this is, we, we, we will need to do something different because uh, so far we have been, and uh, Intesa is, uh, is uh, our client and our partner because we provide a lot of credit line for SMEs, etc. But what we need to change really to have some new products like really risk sharing facility, serious risk sharing facility. And as EBRD, we are probably to think about to take more risk. Uh, take more risk also because if we want support really uh, start up in the region, well, uh, we could not pretend that Intesa or Raffaison or Unicredit take risk without any kind of collateral apart from the env existing environment. We need to, to support in a different way. And uh, I, I, I hope that this is will be something that we will consider more and more as EBRD, but of course with the support of the uh, European Union that already support us in, in certain sectors. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, here, there's a question in the first row, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have to stand it up. <laughs> okay. yeah. and, and I think uh, it's a very interesting uh, we'll talk about SME finance. I remember I joined Asian Dome Bank 1989. 20, 30 years ago, we discussed uh, SME finance and we developed a lot of uh, projects and so on. And we heard the EBRD is very good in uh, SME finance. Now, today, I'm again, <laughs> listen to, uh, we have a lack of uh, SME finance and I have a problem. Probably, no, no one can solve this uh, uh, SME finance because not every SME can qualify to finance, right? And uh, they always demand more than the supply, so this is uh, difficult. But I want just want to add in one more point here, is uh, the SME finance now we again using the traditional banking at that that uh, way, and now this area whether we can doing our, uh, our innovations, and Alibaba, we are always talking about this sell and buy. You do not know that actually they are working very actively in financial sector, 
in 2014, two years ago, they established called the Ant Financial Service Company. Ant is like uh, little animals, so they, they, like they finance uh, the small things. Within two years, now they have uh, financed 2.7 million SMEs with 100 billion US dollars, and within two years. And, and all the money they, they getting together is to do internet. They can land in a company within 30 seconds because with all the cloud, the big data, with all the data, you, how much you pay every month, you pay your, 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 your electric bill, and then all the data they collected, and with the 30 seconds they can send to you. So whether in future, and this is a SME finance, whether we have some new innovative way, I think uh, EBRD definitely have a capacity and have to think about some, some new, otherwise, 20 years after we come here again, we have a SME financial problem. <laughs> we are talking again, again. Yeah, this is my comment. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Uh, I mean, the, the uh, Ali. Uh, well, they go to the internet, Ali, Alibaba. Yeah, uh, but uh, that is, um, it, it points uh, to, the, to the same problem, actually, uh, because uh, Alibaba is able to do that because they collect the data. They know who they are lending to based on a huge data set. And what we were talking about here in terms of credit bureaus or so is trying to achieve the same thing to some extent, to uh, increase the information available to lenders. Now, obviously, we would be very happy to support uh, fintechs if they come into the region. Um, I'm not sure that the data wealth and infrastructure is uh, there yet. Maybe it takes somebody like Alibaba to do it, but uh, definitely a very interesting angle. I don't know, does somebody want to add to that? Um, it's not, uh, not as advanced as some of the, um, the internet models you're talking about, but um, about 10 or 15 years ago, a number of the uh, international institutions, including EBRD, started lending to the non-licensed, non-bank MFIs. Um, and initially, when uh, EBRD and other institutions looked at them, the risk department said, no, these are unbankable, they don't have a regulator, uh, they don't have experienced, skilled spe people, they're lending to the very poor, um, uh, the volume, the individual volumes are low, and the prices are too high. But it turned out to be a very successful segment of uh, the financial sector for EBRD, and I think for these um, uh, socially sort of motivated investment funds like Blue Orchard and Responsibility. There's a whole family of these investment funds. So now all across our region, Southeast Europe, Western Balkans, Central Asia, there's a highly developed uh, non-bank microfinance uh, investment sector. And typically they're lending, you know, in the same area as Ant, um, five, thousand, ten thousand dollars, euros, uh, 20, or in that sort of range. Um, and there have been a few failures and there have been some difficulties. There was a crisis in Bosnia, I think, Julio, which you're well aware of, um, and the regulators got nervous. I think some of the regulators are a bit nervous about these um, uh, financial structures. But I, I think what that represents, uh, uh, Mr. Mintang, is the, the sort of innovation you're talking about. I mean, the banks sometimes need to get outside the or certainly at least the international um, uh, financial institutions need to move outside the comfort area and explore uh, new delivery mechanisms and new technologies. I know um, we're also EBRD like EIB are quite conservative as well, but EIB made a, a hundred million investment in, the, in one of the lending clubs in the UK, uh, one of the crowd lending operations. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how it develops. And I'm sure we'll be inspired by our elder brother, and we will try and look at something in this uh, in this area as well. But fintech is everybody is talking about it. It's a matter of uh, trying to uh, to do it, and I'm sure technology will play a big part in the uh, in the future. Um. Okay. Um, is there another question in the audience? Yes, yeah, Antonio. I just would like to say that one of the problems that we have in the Western Balkans is that the market, also the financial market, are very fragmented and relatively small. And therefore, for operator, it's difficult to recover the cost that you need uh, to set up when you set up operation. 
One of the possibilities is either closer cooperation among the regulator in the area so that uh, uh, financial operators face similar condition, or otherwise the integration of the Western Balkan into the regulatory system of Europe. But we are not yet there as well. And uh, uh, you need a critical mass in order to be able to develop this, si this type of products. And now uh, with very small markets, we are, it's not possible. That's one of the difficulties. Then I just would like to add a few words about the possibility of cooperation with China. Uh, a lot of the foreign direct investment that uh, came from China to Europe has been led by the large groups, uh, by large companies, mostly seeking either technology or market access. But there are a lot of very dynamic SMEs in China, which are also quite innovative as uh, companies, and they are becoming more and more global. What we need to do is to create opportunity for those SMEs in China to contact, to get in touch with the SMEs in the Western Balkan. They may be business opportunity. At the moment, there are no platform. There are no contacts between these type of player. Uh, an effort has to be done uh, probably by the investment uh, promotion agencies in uh, the Western Balkan, but at the same time also by the trade promotion board in China. And I think at provincial level, there are a lot of clusters in uh, in China that are specialized in products that uh, have uh, a presence in Europe, they may take advantage of the lower cost operating in the Western Balkan and the free access that the Western Balkan has to the European Union to set up operation in Europe. All this at the moment is unexplored, and I think there could be some opportunity in uh, developing these sort of channels. Yeah, two, two points I take from there, A, the, the need for regional integration in the Western Balkans, which is a big theme for us, bring these countries closer together, harmonize, that, that would help in, in that respect. And then the second thing, which is a, a little bit related to the discussion we just had in terms of equity investments in, in um, the companies in the Western Balkans, uh, maybe uh, that would be a way for Chinese SMEs to enter the market also in, in terms of looking for um, counterparts of similar size or slightly smaller in, in the Western Balkans that they could partner up with to, to access the EU market uh, with when the, the Western Balkans countries will become EU members. Um, are there any more questions of the over there, please? Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm representing an uh, international engineering company. Uh, we can say that we are not a small, medium uh, enterprise because we employ more than 250 people but uh, um, towards the donors the IFI uh, we uh, see that uh, many times we participate in the tender process subcontracting cannot be more than 20 on 30 percent uh, and we believe that this is sometimes a constraint that is uh, uh, hitting a little bit too much on the price and it could be a little bit more flexible to uh, have a double benefit. A benefit for us in order to be more competitive without uh, losing the quality of the uh, final product, but on the other side, for a small, medium enterprise uh, to have a bigger part of the bigger piece of the cake. Uh, it, it's uh, just a top, it's not a, a real question, but it's a mechanism that uh, we do see every day uh, in this type of process. Um, yes, uh, I understand the point. The question is one of uh, efficiency. Maybe, Mr. Dimanowski, uh, if you want to say something, how do you see, um, uh, I don't know to what extent you're concerned with that, but tendering, is, is it possible to split uh, that into smaller lots to make it, uh, would that be an efficient way of, of tendering or how would you see that, uh, to, to make room for, or more room for SMEs to uh, achieve contracts? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, dividing a project on many sub-projects sub is not a good idea at all, because at the end of the day, you're facing with uh, 10 clients instead of one, and then you're, you're losing the, the quality of the, of the job, uh, because it's one in charge, then you know who are facing with and how to solve the job. Then you will ca uh, another pro another problem comes out. That's uh, co cooperation between them because large infrastructure, for example, projects are uh, 
uh, all the phases in the in the construction works are interconnected between uh, each other. So it's not possible to have the construction way of doing it to be divided by subprojects. But in, in the phase of pro uh, in um, in drafting the project, in the phase of previsibility, feasibility studies, and that kind of stuff, uh, the companies which are uh, which are in the business of uh, drafting the projects are very flexible, and uh, those are small and medium enterprises. Most of them, most of them are very giant, very big, but uh, all of them are interconnected between each other because if they have lack of some knowledge in some field of uh, work they should do, then they are supplementing from someone who is best in that job. And uh, most of the times, uh, those, uh, those, uh, that kind of knowledge comes from the SMEs, especially in projecting, uh, in the projects, in uh, drafting the projects. So the, the, the possibility of the SMEs in this field or in any field is gathering between them in clusters, in uh, building networks on which they will base on after that, instead of be, being uh, many small, to be one united to go on the market uh, when they are looking for services. Uh, big companies, may, maybe this is in the old, uh, old fashion, but for our region now it's new one, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. Uh, the not core businesses of big companies uh, must be covered by uh, operators or outsourced, uh, outsourcing company which will uh, provide services to the big company in order to be more competitive. Because employing to too much people and controlling them all and uh, the, the service or the product you are producing will be lower level of quality. If you employ outsourcing, out, uh, outsourcing company, if you outsource some services from the, from the main procedure we are doing it, then maybe you will have even better product if you're, if you're basing on your main goals or on your core businesses. For example, railways core business is tr transport of goods and passengers. It's not uh, uh, IT, it's not uh, legal department, it's not, uh, I don't know, cleaning. If you, those not co core businesses, if, if they're outsourced, then the service at the end of the day will be on higher level. That is my company's now new st strategy to, to, to start to involve in this uh, procedure for outsourcing in order to improve the quality of service at the, uh, for, for, the, for the customers we have. Sure, yeah, you want to add to it? Um, your, your comment and, and the prior here actually goes to the bigger question which we didn't discuss now, and this is the government involvement and the government impact on the SME especially, which is especially relevant in our region, unfortunately, because the government is way too involved in everything that's being, that's being done. And um, what's worse is sometimes even competing against small and, and medium businesses. So uh, if there's a takeaway there, there's, uh, the biggest takeaway would be that the government should not be involved so much and that the government should actually get out of the way. That would be the most helpful thing they can do. We don't need money from them. We need them to get out of the way. <laughs> But, um, uh, and, but the second thing I wanted to come back is to your comment, and that is that, and I've heard this comment more than once, and that is that there's a lot of money in the market, huge amounts of money. Banks don't know what to do with it. You know, printing presses have been running for 24 hours a day for years and years, and now there's a stockpile, and we don't know what to do with it. But there's no ideas. There's no projects. There's no ideas. There's no innovation. There's, there's nothing like that. I would actually argue against that. There is a lot of ideas. There's a lot of innovation. And I'm specifically talking about, about the Balkans region. There is a lot of ideas, a lot of good ideas. The problem, however, is that people don't know how to start. There's not enough education. And the second, the second problem that I see and I believe is that entrepreneurs are frowned upon. Entrepreneurship has been given a, a, a bad voice, but unfortunately that was created during a period of, of transition in these, in these countries. And this is actually a very large problem, so there's a lot of, there should be an awareness campaign about the benefits of entrepreneurship in this region before we start putting financing. And then the third problem, of course, is the lack of seed financing. You cannot finance an idea from EBRD or from, from, from Intesa. You, you, you can finance it within a scope of a larger, of a company, an existing company, but you cannot finance a, a beginner's idea. Well, thank you very much. I uh, think I just received a signal here that our time is up. I, I think it's a very interesting topic, and I would like to 
discuss more, but I think what comes out of it, uh, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative presents a lot of opportunities for, for SMEs. Uh, they need to access financing to take advantage of it, but there is a lot of uh, work to be done on the early end of the financing, in the early phases of development of companies where they need equity, seed capital. So this will definitely be a challenge, but maybe even we can look to our Chinese partners to uh, help contribute to equity funds or uh, something like that to, uh, to, to maximize the impact that these investments in the Belt and Road Initiative will have in the region. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much also for, uh, to my panelists here. Thank you.